Hello there and welcome to the Bitcoin Takeover podcast. I am Vlad and today we're recording another episode from the very special season 15, which is coming to you in 10 episodes that are getting dumped Netflix style all at once before Christmas. Today we're talking with Tour de Mister or de Mister. It depends on where you're from and how you're going to pronounce this. But he is a Bitcoin and financial analyst and he is the founder of Adam and Capital and he does a lot of stuff. He sits on lots of boards. He has opinions which are pretty balanced, like you would expect someone who comes from more of a financial side of the debate to be more of a suit, you know. But he speaks about cypherpunk history. And what I like most about him is that he is at the intersection between this Austrian economics school of thought and cypherpunk history. And there's also something geeky in him about music, about stuff that he posts. And I I just like his stuff on Twitter. And I'm happy that I get to have him today on the show. Welcome to her. Thanks for having me, Vlad. Happy to be here. Let's talk about the SuperCycle Tour because you're a financial analyst. I can't think of anything more fitting that I should ask you about. You know what that is? I mean, yeah, let's get on the same page. Is uh, the Bitcoin super cycle, is, is it uh, the idea that maybe this time is different and we're going to see a rally that keeps rallying? Is that what it means? Or is it like that the adoption, uh, the Bitcoin price is going to have this S-shaped? No, oh, yeah, no, no, no I think it's, it's the, the, the firmer. The, so cycle. basically like having a super long bull market. Is that, that what it means? No, that's the super cycle. This is the supra cycle oh as in toyota I, supra <laughs> i uh i am uh, please enlighten me so basically i ask myself the question what is the plebs lambo because the point of this is to get a lambo right but most of us will never afford it and even if we could afford it why spend all the money on a lambo so the question is what is 90 percent of the lambo experience at 10 percent of the lambo price And I stumble upon the Supra, the Toyota Supra, which has this very cool legacy. It was featured on the Fast and the Furious. It has a very good reputation among the tuning enthusiasts and it's still being made. And when you look up on any search engine Supra girlfriend, you're going to see that there are thousands of pictures of hot girls that took pictures next to a Toyota Supra. So this is a thing before I turned it into a thing in Bitcoin. So basically... The theory is that we're going to go up according to this ramp right here to 100K. At around 70, 80K, we're going to get a GR Supra, which is the limited edition orange one. And this is the new one. It's actually a BMW under the hood. Not ideal, not 100% Japanese. But if you save more or huddle more, you can get the actual super from the 1990s which was featured in the movies and that one has such a sturdy engine that it came with a base one of 200 something horsepower but you can tune it up to more than 1000 it's a beast you know so you get one of these and then you get a girlfriend and if you have a girlfriend she gets a girlfriend that's the catch so (laughs) it's sort of a meme that's meant to encourage people to not just huddle waiting for something you know some unrealistic goal that may not happen during the bull market just improve your life and do something move move out of your mom's basement get a nice car get a girlfriend and take it from there that's really cool (laughs) i well i uh i endorse the super cycle i don't know if uh if the price goes up like in a linear way like and, and i'm sure you know this is a, a very rough uh, projection, but uh, I think it's really cool to have. Um, yeah, I mean, it's funny that you mentioned the Lambo because um, there was a guy that I followed for a while who was in the crypto and he, he got a Lambo. And uh, my God, he would just post these video updates about. Well, about one third of the videos were like excited about like, oh, I took it on a drive. And then two thirds of the videos were like. Uh yeah, I had to spend another twelve thousand dollars in the garage to get it fixed. And then one time he um 
he posted a video of himself driving it on the German highways. Like he was going so fast and he was like having a great time. And then in the video, the car, the engine exploded. <laughs> and then he, he's posting himself on the side of the road saying like, yes, yeah, so my engine just exploded. And so it's like, man, these things are money pits. So yeah, I mean, absolutely. I think uh, it's the same with a boat. It's like, no, it's not. the If you have enough money to just buy the boat, that's not what it's... This is like an endless money pit, uh, a boat and a Lambo. And so, yeah, if you have like a, a solid sports car that's trusted by a lot of people, that's that's way better. And especially if you can like get a good deal secondhand or something. I agree that it's like 90% of the fun of a Lambo. So, uh, yeah, and I just yeah. want to show you this that I came up with the theory back in September. And since then, it held up pretty well. Oh my god! Yeah, <laughs> that's and so. What are you gonna do if uh, the price overshoots your model? Are you gonna have to like change your model if it, if it goes much faster than what your model is predicting? Well, I'm gonna take a page from the stock to flow book and pretend yeah. that the model has always been the new model <laughs> and say, oh no 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 no, this was. You know, a miscalculation on my behalf. The correct one is this. So I'm going to update it to always be right. Yeah. Basically. Uh, that's good. We're learning from uh, previous people's mistakes. That's great. Yeah. I mean, this is pretty educational, I think, for people. I mean, I, I, my mind is blown. I'm, I'm learning so much. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure what you taught about stuck to flow back in the day. The guy who was promoting the idea was on every podcast i never invited him because it seemed bullshit to me this idea that demand would be constant or increase over time you don't even get that for bread or something very essential for living yeah it seems strange to me to have a and from the beginning i was just like how can you have a a model that only looks at supply and doesn't look at demand like that is just very weird to me uh because then you could have any shitcoin that had a different supply model than Bitcoin, you can then apply stock to flow. But that is like, no, 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 that, you know, it doesn't apply to that. And like it, um, yeah, it, it just uh, seems to me to be uh, an odd model. And also it kind of induced a lot of FOMO with people. Uh, I just, I, I feel like models you have to look at very, very loosely because uh, markets, if they get too focused on it, it's 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 self defeating. It doesn't work anymore. Uh, I think the ultimate thing is just the price, and you can just do some traditional charting. But the, that's the best indicator. Is like you know where is the sentiment of the world market? Is just look at the price because millions of people look at the price every day and base their decisions on it. Um, so yeah, I don't think there's any like uh, what do you call it like a uh, magic you know, magic models that can defeat everything else uh, that doesn't exist, I don't think. And the four-year cycle, at some point, it probably is going to get broken too. Like the, these, you know, the price cycle is going to lengthen or shorten or whatever. It's going to... Because if everyone acts as if it's true, it's going to... Pe the market gets overheated because everybody's anticipating it and then it, it, it defeats itself anyway. Yeah, we tend to create these self-fulfilling prophecies where if enough people believe in something, they're going to make it happen. And that's how bubbles get created. Mm -hmm. And of course, at one point they burst as the market reality is disconnected from the fundamentals. And that's when corrections happen. And yeah, people then take on too much debt all of a sudden. And yeah, exactly. Someone asked me last week when I was on Twitter Spaces, when I think that the bull market is going to end. And he was expecting me to give like a price point, but I gave him more of a social indicator. When, for example, I go get a haircut or uh, I, I do get haircuts, haters. So when I go get a haircut or get a taxi or something and they tell me, oh, I found this new investment opportunity and I'm making so much more money with this app and I think I'm going to quit my job and I'm going to do something else. And I think that's the moment when you realize, OK, time to sell. But what's your indicator? No, I mean, I'm, I'm very much in your camp on that. Like I, I think... Um, because the thing is with price, with the dollar price, for example... 
I don't know how much money printing is going to happen in over the course of the bull cycle, but also, you know, one billionaire could move in ten billion dollars into Bitcoin and then push the average price for everyone all the way up. But that doesn't mean that sentiment is then all of a sudden moved by a certain amount. It doesn't. Um, and so, yeah, I uh, for. It's very, very hard to call the top, and and I feel it e like it's to me at least it's easier to call the bottom because it's just when I feel sick, like when I feel sick is the bottom, but then the top it's like you're you're high for so long that it it um it uh, fogs up your judgment, and so it, it makes it harder to you know to call a top, and it's kind of easier to look at how other people are behaving, like if they're getting like a Bitcoin tattoos and like like you're saying like that exuberant behavior and uh, and also like when when a lot of people that don't know what it is all of a sudden start getting really really involved that is a red flag right because they are the weekends by definition they don't understand what they're getting into they're getting really financially exposed like we saw in 2021 with NFTs and crypto like all the all the Uber drivers were talking about it and so they're the ones who got gonna get scared when there's a correction and sell. So yeah, uh, I'm I'm with you. Like uh, there's financial indicators you could. Well, there is some blockchain analysis that's interesting. You know that you can look at to see if if the top is there. But that also has to do with, you know, are the old coins moving? Like if that that's an interesting one. If um, OG hodlers, like really big whales that have held Bitcoin for a long time, if their coins start to move, it means that they are thinking what you're talking about, that, you know, the Uber drivers are getting too involved and it's probably a good time to diversify a little bit. Um, so when you see that, it's a good indicator of a potential top with with the coins uh, and, and, and the on-chain analysis that you can see that. When you look in retrospect and you see the previous tops, for example, in 2017, there was this mining craze where there were lots of shit coins that you could mine with your GPU and everything had a market valuation that was insane. And you're thinking, why don't I just quit my job and buy more GPUs and mine this whatever Monero loan or something and it's going to make me more money. And that's when the bubble burst, of course, when people realized, okay, this is exaggerated. There's no way we're going to stop creating value for the world around us and just focus on this one task because it's the one that makes more money. It makes no sense. And I think also in 2021, there was that NFT craze. And I, I think Melania Trump was the top signal. Oh, what did she do? She announced her collection of NFTs on Solana. Uh, I forgot about that. Yeah. There was something else also with Katy Perry, I think, in 2017, when she posted a picture of her nails and she had a coin on each finger. And that was also a top indicator. But I think that came in early 2018. And then I think also uh, in 2021, um, FTX announcing that they were going to sponsor this stadium for a crazy amount of money. Mm -hmm. That was also a good top signal. Yeah, I mean, basically, if if too many people start thinking that they can get something for nothing, like that's the definition of unsustainable. Yeah, but and it then, gets pretty nihilistic from here because they're going to say, yeah, but Bitcoin also came out of nothing. And in the early days, it was w worthless. And we, it has value only because we believe it has value. So it, it becomes very postmodernist in this regard. And they say that anything that they create with similar narratives might just have the same market success. That's what they're pushing. Yeah, I mean, it's, it, it's, it's not true, of course. You know, it's the same as saying like, oh, but the English language is worthless because I can just copy it and change half the words and, 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 and then it's like, and then what? Like, you're the only one speaking your shitty language then. Like, it's, it's not no. the same as like, you know, or it's like saying like, oh, but the Bible, you know, I could just take the Bible and change a, a third of the chapters and then, and then. No, make that actually works. Religion. Sorry. 
<laughs> well, yeah. There, I mean, so there are some forks, you know, but at least, you know, it, but there, there is still, it doesn't mean that the Bible is worthless or that the English language is worthless. Um, the fact that if you copy it, there is, uh, that it's easy to copy, so to speak. Like, it doesn't mean that you're copying the network of people that are connected through this, this thing, uh, this phenomenon. I think that um, a better example is Esperanto, the language. And I don't mean to make fun of the Esperanto people. It's a language that consists of words from many European languages. And it's supposed to be this universal language. Nobody speaks that, this, as far as I know. It's more of an intellectual exercise. It's like Klingon, yep. you know. It's a way to signal a certain social status if you speak that. But yeah, and didn't they borrow from a uh, roman like a uh, from from the romanian language uh isn't the, i remember reading something that like esperanto was like a, like because it draws inspiration from several languages um i don't know maybe it's not true but I, I thought i remembered that um but yeah it was supposedly like oh but this is the most logical and simple language and so everyone is going to adopt it it's like well no, because you, you can't compete with the network effects of a language that's evolved over thousands of years. When you think about it, even Latin has network effects still today. If you become yeah. a lawyer, you're going to speak Latin in court. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And I mean, there's so much intellectual history that is, you know, like a, still to this day, if you read, uh, I just bought the the uh, Ainit by, I think it's Ovidius. And so it's just directly translated from Latin. And so however English is going to evolve, that original source is always going to be Latin. Mm. And the and the yeah, and some of the some of the the ancient ancient philosophy is only stored I think in Latin because of uh that maybe the Greek text was lost. Mm. Yeah, so to come back to Bitcoin, I think the point that we're trying to make here is that you can't really bit, beat something original that grew organically and has an actual user base. Yeah, and so that to me is that's going back to like the exuberance. Is like thinking that you get something for nothing is that's above and beyond that Bitcoin is a robust store of value for the long term. Like, yes, it's going to deflate over the long term, but in the short term, you can have overinflated expectations of like, oh, you know, the super cycle is, is going to go to 5 million in two years. You know, that that's the flaw. And that's, people need to get punished for that financially. Yeah, I mean, not financial advice with my super cycle model, but it's sort of like the rainbow chart. It was made for fun and then it turned out to be correct and it, it gets pretty crazy from here yeah that's true the rainbow chart is that uh the log scale right where bitcoin just seems to go in this arc uh but i think interestingly enough if you imagine that dollars are going to inflate and hyperinflate then that rainbow is going to all of a sudden turn up <laughs> it's going to look more like an s um as as fiat goes to zero so yeah. that's why I'm all, I always I always hesitate to give long term price predictions because it's like I don't know like yeah a million dollar Bitcoin sure but what does that mean if you can only buy a bicycle with a million dollars? Yeah, that's a very good point, and most people don't think about what this implies. As you can get to a million dollars, but pay maybe ten thousand for a hamburger. Yeah, and people like people where you live in Eastern Europe know that better than most, and people in Latin America know that better than most. Uh, you cannot just count on inflation staying within a band of two to five percent. Like it, eh, no, that's not how history works. But I gotta say that for all the inflation that happened and all the money printing we've had in the last few years. I don't like saying it, but at the same time, I have to give it to the central bankers. I think they did a pretty good job slowing this down. <clears throat> yeah, I mean, yeah. I mean, honestly, didn't we all expect something worse, like a collapse of the system? I mean, bonds are crashing. Like bonds are down about 50% if you correct for inflation and over the last few years. Uh, that, that's And that's like the most pristine, long-dated government bonds. So, 
I don't know. Yeah, of course. So let's give them some credit. You know, the system has not blown up yet. They're kicking the can down the road. People who want to get off the Titanic and the lifeboat, they can still do it. Wasabi Wallet is unfairly private. It's the most advanced, most used Bitcoin privacy wallet with a half a million downloads across Windows, Mac OS and Linux, as well as thousands of fresh and new Bitcoins get mixed every month. Wasabi makes use of the new generation Wabisabi engineer to create mega coin joints, thus mixing your bitcoins with those of hundreds of other users. For amounts lower than 0.01 BTC and remixes, you pay no coordination fee. If you don't use the coin joints, Wasabi Wallet has a native Tor integration and downloads block filters to help you keep your network level and public key privacy. Download Wasabi Wallet for free today at wasabiwallet.io and experience the future of Bitcoin privacy. Yeah, I very much agree with this, but you know, it's funny when you have situations where companies like Tether buy US bonds, and it's actually a pretty good strategic move. I mean, it sounds antithetical to their ethos, but when you realize that they're actually making themselves more politically resilient by buying bonds, that's when you realize, okay, they're basically making it hard for the US to go against them. Because they're going to go against their own bonds and crash their own market. Yeah, I keep saying that Tether is actually designing a blueprint for other central banks to follow. Like this is the only viable model. Like because if you're going to hold foreign reserve exchange, uh, yeah, Forex reserves as a a national bank, your reserves are going to go to zero. And, And one step above that is short dated bonds because at least you have... It's you're staking, <laughs> you get some return, so you fight inflation a little bit, and then you do that to support your stable coin, so you that uh, you always are backed at least one to one. But then you make a little profit, and with that profit, you can then invest in hard assets like Bitcoin and gold, and that's what Tether is doing. So it's like a, it's a great playbook for central banks to if they want to stay in existence. Uh, you know, it's like the good the good days are really over like they 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 were in a in an environment of declining interest rates and that's where they were able to get away with a lot and now tides are turning and um everybody's going to start struggling for survival and they're going to they're going to go at each other like central banks and governments are not going to always be aligned in in what they what they what they want and need it's going to be really interesting yeah it's- See that here already with politicians trying to give handouts and increase wages and central bankers being like, no, that's a bad idea. Don't do it. You're opening the floodgates for something that you can't even comprehend. It's yeah. And then it's like, yeah. And like in Europe, it's like, it's because that's where the euro is still very new. I remember being in elementary school. I was 12 years old when the euro was introduced and they would like, you know, hand around some some uh some bills oh no actually it was later i was in high school yeah yeah this i was probably like 16 17 um yeah around the year 2000 yeah and so it's an experiment that's only about 25 years old um and once these countries are going to be like we want to print our own money um they might step out of the euro uh and and then of course the problem is how do you defend creating a shitcoin out of zero if there's already a hundred thousand shitcoins in the world because like it used to be that only governments could make digital money and now anyone can do it so how are they going to justify any value for if the gilder comes back or the french franc or something like that i mean maybe they could try going on a gold standard because at least they have some gold in the bank and it's 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 like a between a rock and a hard place if they stay with the euro they're screwed if they get out of the euro, they're also screwed. I mean, a Bitcoin standard is going to be the only way to go, I think. Yeah, I was going to ask you, since you express a lot of these opinions that present Bitcoin in a more historical perspective, if you believe that Bitcoin was discovered more than it was invented. 
Yeah, I think so. You know, I I, I had the chance to read Aaron Van Weerdem's uh, recent book, um, the the Genesis book, which is, by the way, it's coming out on January third, which is when the Genesis block was uh, first produced. It's pretty pretty clever, uh, but it's a great book, and it, it shows you know gradually how the components that eventually became Bitcoin have had gradually been designed and then Satoshi put it all together. Um, and I, I mean, in a way it was invented on this in a specific sense, like just how you can say like, um, a carpenter created a chair with four legs. And so like he created a very unique chair, but the concept of the chair was going to eventually emerge anyway, like the, with the four legs and with support for the back, like they just make logical sense. So you can argue that some of the specifics, you know, we have to really credit Satoshi for like whatever the 21 million cap, you know, why is it that number and other things like that, the use of specific algorithms uh, over others, but conceptually I would say it's a discovery. Yeah. I remember listening to a presentation by Adam Back back in 2019, Back Back in 2019. And he basically mentioned that solving the double spending problem has been a holy grail among cypherpunks for a couple of decades. And that's when it hit me, you know, hearing it from him that this isn't just something that came out of nowhere. It's something that some people have been trying to find, to discover, to figure out. And during my interviews, I've also had the opportunity to speak with the creator of Electrum, Thomas Vogtlin. Oh, he's and great. Yeah, yeah. From he, told me that he was also working on something similar with Bitcoin, but his concept was entirely different. <clears throat> yeah, I mean, there may be other ways to skin the cat but i intuitively i agree with adam that he says that there is a kind of a very limited design space within which bitcoin becomes possible like if you imagine all the variables put them in a row and you change the dials of like block size and difficulty adjustment and that actually viable variations on Bitcoin are, you cannot deviate a lot from what's already there. And that invalidates the thesis of so many of the alternative coins because they are always, in implicitly what they're saying is we can do it better. We can do it, make a better Bitcoin. And, uh, and usually they just cut corners and become centralized anyway. Yeah, and you mentioned Adam Back. I know that you're an investor in Blockstream. And I was going to ask you something controversial because it's so hard to support Blockstream when you see that most of their projects have failed and so many of their developers have left. How's it going? How does it feel to be an investor? <laughs> it's going great. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I think it's really interesting. I was thinking about it today. That uh, that and that's that's why I invested as well because I actually I only invested in like twenty twenty one, so I'm, I haven't been invested for that long. Um, but um, they are a bit like the dark horse, and um, that's how I see them, at least, in, in the crypto Bitcoin space. And um, I think it it is pretty easy to take a shot at them and be like, oh, they've been around since 2014. Like, what have they got to show for it? You know, like other... Um, but but think about it from this point of view. Like, imagine you're a Bitcoin-only company, so you don't do shit coins at all. And you have to survive these brutal um, uh, cycles in an environment where hodlers are extremely stingy. They don't want to buy Lambos; they want to buy Supras, and not today, but they're still waiting for it. Mm -hmm. You know, so it's like, and then you can mine, like which they started to do. Uh, Blockstream is 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 partly a mining company, but other than Bitcoin mining, there was extremely little. Uh, opportunity for Bitcoin companies to actually generate cash flow. You could you could create hardware wallets. Trezor did that, but they also started diversifying into shit coins. Uh, same with Ledger. Um, you know, and then yeah, like you know, NVK has a cold card, and there's a few Bitcoin only products, but those are like small, relatively small time projects that, of course, you know, have grown. Um, so to me. 
Blockstream deserves some some slack, you know, for for being a very mission focused company and for being very research uh, and development focused. Like they have a very broad set of technologies that they're working on. Like both uh, at the bottom layer, they started off with with core developers and pioneering a lot of the uh, soft forks that eventually were put into Bitcoin. Uh, and and still, uh, I think it's, uh, Taproot. Um, I believe uh, Andrew Poolstra also worked on that. So they basically have in house so much knowledge, and of course, you know, there's some there's some um, you know people move around. You know, like not every developer is going to stay with the same company all the time. But the the level of technical ability in in Blockstream is just extremely high, combined with people that really. Um, think long term and so yeah they have they have the satellite project they have uh, the liquid sidechain which could become really huge um they have the the blockstream jade they have lightning technology in house so they're like you know they they do mining obviously um so they have this full stack i believe they're also actually developing a mining chip if i remember right uh and then they have financial products so i i wouldn't uh you know, I wouldn't underestimate Adam and 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 kind of like what these people are working on, um, because also in the crypto and Bitcoin space, we were talking about these cycles, and so it, it, there are opportunities that are very short term. You know, in the bull cycle, like in the eighteen months or two years of a bull phase, people would throw money at anything, and so if you pander to that and if you play to the market and be like, here's this sexy product and deep down you know it doesn't make sense you can still make money selling it so you know i think that's where the perception comes from like oh but blockstream missed a lot of opportunities it's like well i mean they didn't go up into flames like barry silver did you know they didn't there's a lot of things that did not happen to them um where where other people got into a lot more trouble and even like now like lightning is it possible that some of these lightning developments were a little bit premature, uh, you know, a little bit premature in terms of assuming that block space was going to remain cheap in Bitcoin and that therefore you can just onboard millions of people and, and the by having everyone open lightning channels, et cetera, maybe, I mean, who, who's to say, right? I'm, I'm not, I'm not trying to poo poo lightning, but, but um, I think there, sometimes it takes a while to, to make something successful. And uh, I love the just how prudent uh, and uh, mission-focused uh, Blockstream is in terms of supporting Bitcoin for the long run with a broad, um, with a broad um, array of technologies. And then, of course, you, know, you have to be humble and leave it up to the market to decide which one they want you know, in particular. Now, when I referred to failures, I was thinking specifically to two of their projects. The first one is Liquid, which never really got traction in the last five years. It has been mm -hmm. around for five years now. And yet I saw one of their leading marketing guys bragging about having five or six transactions per block, as in they're getting some traction. Mm -hmm. But it honestly, it's a bit embarrassing for Bitcoin and for a sidechain to only deal with that after such a long time and after they invested so many resources in promoting this. I know that Samson at one point, while he was at Blockstream, he pushed more for Liquid to become the main venture. And for some reason, and I'm not sure if it has something to do with the federated system that some people didn't like, but also the users didn't embrace it. And there are no, as far as I know, third-party wallets that are built for it. All of them are made by Blockstream or related companies like Janfree. So there's still some stuff that's missing from their tool set. And there's also C Lightning, which has been rebranded as Core Lightning. That one is pretty good. It's much more robust and stable than LND by Lightning Labs. But still, it seems to be not the more dominant client. And they also tried to push for Bolt 12, if I'm not mistaken. It was Rusty who was working on that and tried to turn it into a standard all across the board. And they were not able to agree on that one. And it seems like development hasn't gone too far in the last couple of years. Maybe I'm being ignorant and I'm not paying attention enough. 
to what's going on. It's only my perception that it seems like Core Lightning didn't get that big and neither did Liquid. But for the record, Core Lightning is bigger than Liquid. Yeah, I mean, um, if you design products for an environment of pretty extreme hostility, right, where you're assuming uh, government censorship um, because you built censorship resistance into what you're doing, and you're also assuming very high on-chain fees, then the stuff that you're going to be prioritizing might not harmonize with how the market feels in the moment. Um, and for example, you know, like Solana, like, or, or some, some of the other developer chains, they are not worried about government crackdowns. They seem to really focus on transaction speeds, um, developer friendliness and um and uh, accessibility like you know the the amount of tools that are available and so basically as long as there is no really real crackdown although maybe now that's changing with like tornado cash and like that that seems to be one of the first like so-called DeFi projects that's been really under fire um as long as it's not tested it's hard to see what the advantages of using like a clunky project like um like blockstream because i'm sure i'm I, I mean i'm not a coder i'm sure it's less you know polished than uh, a lot of the other projects um but then, of course, the test is going to be like, well, what if the crackdown does come, and uh, and uh, you know, is that where Blockstream can shine? I suspect that it, it will be. And also, when on-chain fees get really, really high, I think that's what their products are designed for. And so, yeah, you cannot predict when exactly those circumstances are going to come together. Um, so I'm not surprised that people are are skeptical of of what they're building. I, I believe they have integrity. I, I know a bunch of the people there. I just feel they have that cypherpunk integrity, and um, they're not just building like a doomsday shelter. Like they're they're really trying to build real technology that can be used in the world reliably uh, in a slightly more adversarial environment than we live in today. And um, yeah, like I said, like Solana, like. I mean, imagine the budgets that these guys have to, you know, market their stuff and to do all kinds of hackathons, and because because that the more little projects are associated with them, the the more they look like a blue chip crypto to invest in. And that was a bit like that with Yahoo, the the search engine uh, back in the '90s. They they would. Uh, promote startups on their website and be like, you know, if you want to get popular on the internet, you got to partner with us, pay us advertising dollars, and then we're going to promote you and our search engine is the best and the email is the best, etc. So a lot of Wall Street analysts thought that Yahoo was amazing, even though they were <laughs> manually scraping the internet to build portals where people could find new websites versus Google, which was doing it right and, and acknowledging like the internet is growing so fast, you can never have enough human beings to manually browse the internet to index it. We need uh, algorithms. And of course, that took a longer time. Less people understood how that worked. There was more skepticism. Uh, but of course, ultimately, Google won in the long run. And it took like, I think it took like 10 years before Google stock was worth more than Yahoo. So I don't know, just to like, you know, give some context as to why... Um, why I'm sympathetic to to Blockstream. Yeah, and to their credit, I think something nice that is happening right now is that they're going to have Arc being deployed on top of Liquid. I think that's interesting because if we were to have that on Bitcoin, we would need the Covenant software, which if I'm not mistaken is BIP 119. And in the absence of that, we can see how it works on Liquid, which already has Covenants. But you mentioned Solana and something that I very much enjoy about your tweets is how direct you are in your disdain for Ethereum. And <laughs> you hate it. And I like it. <laughs> I like the fact that you hate it. I'm not saying I like Ethereum. I'm just saying that I like that you're honest. And the fact that the market proved you wrong 
over the last few years did not deter you from changing your fundamental analysis and opinion on the project? Yeah, yeah, I used to be more like kind of um, try to be careful or humble or like, you know, I, I giving the benefit of the doubt to the developers and, and things. And and now I just feel more of a responsibility. Like I, I, I've studied it long enough that I really in my core believe that there is deception baked into the cake, that they are not what they say they are, that it's going to fail in the long run, that people are going to lose their money uh, betting on it. And so I see it as an attack on, on the cypherpunk project. I believe it's, uh, you know, cause if you, that is what snake oil is or a fool's gold is you, you, you sell something and you say, Oh, but this thing is cheaper and better than the other thing, but it's not, you're just lying. And so to me, all the money that goes to Ethereum and the developer energy and everything else is not going to Bitcoin. And also it, it pollutes the um, whole ethos, the whole moral project that Bitcoin stands for, which is defending human rights, um, allowing individuals to assert themselves in a digital world, having autonomy, etc. And you, oh, you totally undermine that with a project that is fundamentally centralized and that it has some like fancy DeFi crypto young what is it young cat or something like all these memes associated with it. Um, it's watering it down. It's it's a it's an attack. So that's that's why I feel strongly about it. Uh, I I you know my I I sleep very well. Like I don't I don't seethe in my hatred, but I I do really uh, have disdain for uh, what this project is. I think it's very destructive. Well, I agree with you, but it's still a nice sandbox for ideas that were not good enough for Bitcoin. I'm sympathetic to developers who just say, yeah, if this is not good enough for this project, I'm going to try it somewhere else and prove you wrong or else I'm going to be proven wrong. Yeah. Yeah, but that's to me, it's like, I've heard that so many times, but it's like, yeah, but do a test net, you know, you can build a sandbox and play around, but, but there's so much recklessness that has gone into uh, these, um, these projects where it's like, why do you need to involve tens of thousands of witless investors in your, in your laboratory projects? You know, like just do your research and, and, and publish papers and do it the scientific way. Do it how they do in the open source world. And, but don't pretend to be like a noble scientist while you're dumping your shit coins on the masses. Because oftentimes the, the, the projects that they're making, they have already been tried in the past. They were discussed in Bitcoin talk in 2011 and 2012. And, and, um, or they're on a theoretical level, they're just completely unworkable and they launch them anyway. It's just because they're fooling the new people that are coming in. It's, it's, I, I meet very, very intelligent people that are of all kinds of ages and they all get fooled into these shit coins. You know, it, it is very disheartening and, and that's, it, it really also makes it so that the regulatory environment gets more hostile towards Bitcoin because it's associated with all these scams. So I think that, you know, I feel like a responsibility to represent some of the immune system is like, hey, we got to defend uh, the values that Bitcoin stands for. Um, and so, yeah, so you can do coins on a test net or like, like you were mentioning uh, with these federated sidechains, you can port Bitcoins to a more risky environment and play around with it there. The same with Lightning port some Bitcoin to lightning and experiment with it there, build your tokens. Why does, do you have a need to have a free floating token to, to um, test out a new technology? Like just play with Bitcoin, like put, you know, do it, make it a Bitcoin project. Crypto steel offers a durable physical backup for cryptocurrency key and recovery words. These user-friendly cold storage devices withstand harsh conditions, including fires, floods, and earthquakes. Made from the finest European stainless steel, they are built to last. Accessible to all and requiring no computer skills, the original Crypto Steel cassette and capsule have been innovating Bitcoin security since 2013. They provide a reliable and robust backup, essential for the safety and longevity of your digital investments. Ideal for protecting your digital wealth. Crypto Steel isn't just a one-trick pony. Of course, it works with your Beep39 seed phrase 
but you can also use it for important passwords, Bitcoin core passphrases, Nostra private keys, and much more. Buy your CryptoSteel metal backup today from CryptoSteel.com and use promo code BTCTKVR to get a 10% discount. CryptoSteel, secure your Bitcoin like an OG. So this one statement of yours reminded me of Paul Stortz, who says the exact same about his drive chains. Well, I mean, he's proposing a soft fork to Bitcoin, which ha is um, like I'm not that well versed in the in the details, but his soft fork um, that he needs to do his project is um, contested. You know, some people think that it, it could hurt Bitcoin in the long run. And so it's different, right? I mean, if if he could build a side chain with the exactly using Bitcoin the way it is now, well, yeah, then do that. But he's saying like, no, 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 I want this special side chain. So I don't to me it's like like it's almost like, you know, you live in the United States and there's the constitution and you can do all kinds of especially in the early 19th century, you can try all kinds of things. But if it's like, yeah, but I want to do, I don't know. I want to do a, an experiment that's going to have to ch need a change in the constitution for me to be able to do it. That's like, well, you, you, you just got to do it elsewhere then. Um, I don't know. I just, I, I also think that Paul could have possibly achieved more had he like his way of communicating isn't always you know helping people feel like they want to collaborate with him um so i think that's a challenge too but of course i mean we have people like luke who's also not you know the most the communicator that everybody loves and and he has done done things so i don't know i just I, I don't think that, I think Paul can test his technologies in ways that don't require a, a soft fork in Bitcoin and don't require like creating a shit coin. This is sort of an unrelated remark, but I find it funny when we speak about Luke and Paul and Peter and all of these apostle names from the Bible. Oh, wow. That's funny. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, it's so early days, you know, some of these names are going to be remembered for uh, a few hundred years. I mean, I don't know. I don't know which one, but some. Yeah, anyway, I think that something that was a major breakthrough in the last couple of months is BitVM. And I've spoken to a few developers in Argentina during Lab BitConf, and they told me that they can do decentralized sidechains without the need for a soft fork with that one, because it does computation of chain. So it's a way of doing stuff without changing the rules of the system. Yeah, and it seems to me that the challenge, at least, again, I'm not an expert on sidechain, but it's, it seems to me that the challenge with doing a decentralized sidechain is something to do with minor incentives. Like you're kind of like making the sidechain, it weighs a lot more all of a sudden. It can hold a lot more economic value. And yet it is it's kind of like standing on a narrow basis because it's like the way it's plugged into the Bitcoin main chain. And so... Um, it seems like there's incentives potentially for miners to game this, the decentralized sidechain and, and basically s sort of steal money or make a deal with people that have a big financial interest in a certain project on the sidechain. Um, and so, yeah, anyway, that, that's the, so there's all kinds of like subtle economic debates that um, seem to because blockstream tried right they they really tried to develop a, a this de decentralized sidechain idea and they ended up landing on the federated model as being actually more you know more of a balanced um um approach uh but but, but you know if you can do it by all means like you should try it like if you can do it without changing bitcoin like I, i'm not that familiar with uh, bit vm did you say or bitcoin vm yeah bit vm bit vm yeah Let it's me... made by a guy named robin and i've also interviewed as part of this season of the podcast super testnet who is a guy from the us 
Mm. And he is a very interesting character if you meet him in person. But he's super smart. I'm I'm not doubting that. And yeah, he, that's he is so wacky that he came up with this concept that he wants to basically create this smart contract on top of Bitcoin where there's a condition for spending and that condition is that you run Pokemon on the Game Boy in your virtual machine and you catch Pikachu and that's how you unlock the private key. Uh, that's cool. That's funny. Yeah, I know. Mm-hmm. It, it sounds silly when you say it like this, but the technicalities behind it are pretty incredible. Wow, yeah. I mean, uh, there is. Uh, it's interesting. As Bitcoin grows, like there's just whole areas where I start to kind of lose knowledge because um, it's it's getting so big. Um, and also, I guess my my focus isn't isn't like is, is is kind of moved past the technical stuff. Like if I need to know something about a big controversy, I, I know who to talk to. Um, but uh, I'm I'm mo- mostly focused on Bitcoin. The asset, you know, the store of value, and um, and how it's going to affect society, and 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 what is going to um, it just changes so much. It's almost like the laws of physics of society are starting to change. And so, what does that mean? Like that, I spend a lot of time thinking about that. Um, and then the the debates within Bitcoin. I think gradually Bitcoin is ossifying more. Like there's definitely some stuff moving about this. It's not decided what is going to be layer two, and maybe there's going to be multiple layer twos to, to make Bitcoin work. Um, so I'm I'm still trying to follow that. Mm. Yeah, what I like once again, I've said this in the intro. What I like the most about you is that you're not. How should I put it? You're not taking only one side. In Bitcoin, you tend to have these Austrian economists who follow religiously their creed and they interpret bitcoin according to their own teachings and then you have the cypherpunks who basically defy most of what the austrian economists say and they're like no it's a bad idea to ossify it's a bad idea to do this and that it's software we should treat it like software and then you find yourself somewhere in between and you have some very good points usually so that's what i really like about you thank you yeah, it, it it is like it's almost like Bitcoin is challenging the world to like if all the scientific disciplines can kind of be a little humble and just like lean in to be like, hmm, there's a lot that we don't understand, or this thing seems to violate some of our laws. Well, let's like reconsider that and maybe by all of us leaning in, we can have a more universal um world of sciences that understand each other more because there's there's so many sciences that just live on islands and that's part of what i'm trying to do with the texas bitcoin foundation is we're trying to build bridges between the social sciences and of course you know physics somehow ties into that at some point and then it goes beyond that but but um Bitcoin is such an interesting thing because it's it's almost like a new form of life that started to live. And then people are like, yeah, but this violates our law. And it's like, yeah, but it's walking around. It's doing its thing. So shouldn't you like look in the mirror and reconsider? So it, even like I was very staunch Austrian, you know, I, I really um, was very, very much into Austrian economics. And yet um, all of a sudden Bitcoin seemed to violate one of their laws that like, oh, but you know, money, it, it should originate in, in a commodity that people use on a daily basis. And so Bitcoin was just, was not that, therefore it can never be money. Like they, they just dogmas basically. So yeah, if I can inspire more people around the world to, um, to take a more interdisciplinary approach where you're really trying to think from the bottom up and rethink what's there. Cause we live in a pretty messy world, like modernism, postmodernism. like it's just, people are very lost. And so one of the big projects, uh, maybe the biggest is going to be to find new integrated philosophies that 
we that give us peace and that create a peaceful society like you know you can look back at the middle ages and be very critical of that but there was a kind of a consensus about how to do things and it i think it was a very there is there is benefit to that and that i think we can live in a much more diverse world and a much more interconnected world and still have more of a common project than we have now and now it's like it's almost like this age is defined by discord and conflict and relativism and cynicism and cynicism and you know so how do we find meaning is 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 what really excites me hmm. i think it's unprecedented for us to get exposed to this large amount of information which is conflicting and that's why you told me that you find some otherwise very smart people who get trapped into shit coins. It's most of the times because of some ideological belief. And yeah. they don't like Bitcoin probably because they don't like proof of work. And they bought into some narrative that it's wasteful and it's bad for the environment. So this one idea will make them look into something that basically speaks for them makes them say, oh, this is better because of this. So they start from this agreement that they have with something else. And then they backtrack and say, how can we make it be more like Bitcoin? And that's where they're going to have a big disillusionment because <clears throat> that's not really how it works. That's not how you build. I don't think any innovation in this world was built around the idea. How, how do we make it more? I mean, I'm going to cause some controversy with this but nobody innovated thinking how to save the environment that's not how automobiles were made that's not how yeah. computers were made yeah, yeah. you have to start from somewhere create something have a good prototype that works and then you can have this idea as an afterthought how you can minimize waste it's part of refining something it's not the starting point of an invention yeah, I was also thinking of, you know, like Karl Marx, basically what he, what he thought, or maybe he didn't acknowledge it to himself, but it's like, I feel like the core of his issue was, he was like, well, I don't like that other people decide how much my, my, what the value of my work is. I don't like that other people will decide that and pay me money only based on what they think my work is worth. I want to get paid money on what I think my work my work is worth, which is like the ultimate entitled, you know, entitled the entitled person thinks like that. And then he just built his whole whole utopian philosophy on that. And 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 this kind of victim mentality where like, oh no, like we're gonna have a just society where like I write one book and I get this much in reward. That's fair. It's like, no, you can write a book and nobody cares. And that's just how it is because value is subjective. Um, that's why they say if you want to become a philosopher, become rich first. <laughs> <laughs> Nobody's but gonna buy it's it, also though. true. If you look at some examples, I know you're, I mean, I don't want to dox your origins, mm -hmm. but you're European. And I guess you know about Voltaire. And there's this ongoing, I mean, it was also happening during their lifetimes, but there was this fight between Voltaire and Rousseau. And Rousseau was this Swiss guy who came from this very upper middle class family, but at the same time struggled with finances for all of his life and was unable to find people to finance his research, basically. So he had to live with older women who were part of noble families. He had to give up his children for adoption. Yeah, yeah five he of them, I think. He did some very shady stuff just to keep on writing. But at the same time, Voltaire, he lived off some very productive investments that he made when he was young. And he was able to be an intellectual and participate in debates in Paris just by virtue of being a good investor. Yeah, and I think it's like... There's such a... I think people underestimate the 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 impact of the economic machine on which ideas get promoted in society. Uh, it's not like there is always a battle of ideas and the best ones win. It's often like which ideas get the most economic backing. And if you live in a fiat society, 
who's going to make the most money? It's going to be the people that use financial leverage and that focus on consumer products to like feed all these bubbles that are going to profit off of them, like real estate flippers, real estate developers, uh, uh, grocery store chains early on. And then, of course, um, just consumer products like Amazon, like, you know, bringing those things, cheap things to the masses. Um, and so, but then the, the richest people are catering to the most, um, I don't know how to say this. Like there is a, even like, you know, literal gambling empires. We have like people running casinos and stuff. They make a lot of money and that money they invest then in charities and education and all that. And so, but that's colored money. Like if, if that's different from the money that was made in, by guys that were digging for oil and, 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 uh, building mine mines and stuff. That's just anyway. So, and so I think the world is really going to change intellectually because of how much money Bitcoiners will have to because what if you have a thousand Bitcoin and you're on your deathbed and you want to do something good for the world, but uh, where you, I don't know, it's, it's worth a billion dollars. That is going to be different, differently allocated than if you, all your life you built a burger chain and you know you're on your deathbed like that you're going to give to different charities and part of those are going to be universities and and um the the production of ideas um so to me it's i feel like the next 20 percent or even 50 percent of the world's billionaires in the next uh, maybe over in, in 30 years we're gonna have half of all the world's billionaires that are bitcoiners and so i want to think about okay well how do we best invest that money in, in, in the sense of like, what are the meaningful endeavors other than, cause it stops, right? You buy one Lambo, you buy one house and then, you know, what, what do you, it stops somewhere, you know, you, you want to leave a legacy. And so what, what is that? What is our going to be our legacy? That that's exciting for me to think about. Hmm. I'm also of the opinion that our times need a much better and more optimistic philosophy that's driven by progress. As I feel like in the early 2000s, when I was a kid, everyone was excited. It seemed like the world was going to become more peaceful. I guess this was before 9-11. And there was this sense of progress and everyone's life was improving year after year. The Cold War was over. And then we ended up feeling more disillusioned with technology, the same device. For example, in the 90s and early 2000s, you had maybe the Nintendo 64, the PlayStation or whatever. Those were your gadgets. And then you all of a sudden, a video game console that has a microphone that is listening to you all the time. And that was the case with the Xbox One. And... It, it's just a niche example for something that starts out as something that's useful for yourself and that you control and ends up becoming both useful, but also your own enemy and something yeah. that can be used against you. So this no, surveillance, yeah. I think it's shaped much of the pessimistic philosophy that we have nowadays. Everyone I think feels... That's fair, yeah. Also social media, you know, like it's a, it's like a, the algorithms, they, they really try every, they try very hard to make you addicted. And so they're, they're like hacking your brain, right? They're really trying to hack your system into doing what they want, which is to stay engaged and click on the next thing. Um, so yeah, it is, it is like, um, it's a bit of yin and yang, right? I mean, something that started off as good. Like I remember the, the nineties online was awesome. Being online in the 90s was like amazing. You would like click around and find like these new websites and like, and, and they were very pure. The websites were like not built by marketing machines or big teams. Like there's just some guy, there's so many blogs who are just some dude making his own, like you, like you, you have your, you know, your podcast channel. Like somebody would have like a project like that. It was like all their time went into building this one website. Um, and then, yeah, you would just kind of, chat back and forth and so it was just cheaper than calling and you can meet people all around the world yeah and so some of that innocent it's similar with bitcoin as well like things things change a bit and um but so i feel like it's part of growing up is that you you need to 
learn to live in this new world and 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 take the good things and find a way to just leave the bad things behind but yeah i do i don't know if it's just technology i think there is something about just governments have made it darker like there's been more monopoly government monopolies and more intrusion from the, the it's almost like a gigantism we've seen governments grow into like you know when when you have too much growth hormones you become like disfigured and like really like like a I don't know, like a monster almost. That's how governments have grown because of their ability to print money. Like they they are able to raise more money from like suck more money out of the economy than ever before in history. Like governments used to tax like five or ten percent once, and that was it. People had their own savings. But with the printing press, they can just they can just take over and over and over uh based on every transaction. Um so I think that there is that the gloominess that we associate with technology is probably more like a symptom rather than that the technology itself is the cause. Um, but that's just my feeling. Like I, in general, like it is always true that, you know, if, if you come up with chemicals for agriculture, like, oh, all of a sudden food gets a lot cheaper because you can grow it faster, but also there's health risks because pesticides and whatever, things that we didn't think about. Uh, or like Röntgen, like the x-rays is like, oh, it's great. But we have to be careful because if you use too much, you get cancer. Um, so I think that in 2009, Facebook came out with the, with the mobile version of Facebook. And apparently mental health really started to decline among youth, young people. Um, and so uh, I, 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 these are some of the challenges. Like our parents had smoking as a challenge. We have social media. Um, you know, it's a uh, interesting time. I mean, so, but I agree that the, the optimism has changed. If you listen to popular music and listen to the lyrics, the lyrics are really depressed nowadays. You know, like I like Post Malone a lot, for example, and, and, but some of the, uh, and I feel like it, it's like, you just feel this unease. Whereas in the nineties, it's like, yeah, it was also like, yeah, I'm hurting, but there was more of a range of, of emotions and there was more optimism. Um, and I think you caught the end of that when you were young, like the, the early two thousands, late nineties, but all the nineties, I think were like a real period of like, it was almost like the hippie era, like a little bit of the hippie era that came back. <clears throat> Hello, Bitcoin Takeover listeners. This is Victor from IVPN. We could have produced the flash yet with lofty claims, but we like the straightforward approach, so I'll just uh, stick to the basics here. How are we different from other VPN providers? IVPN is run by Bitcoiners. We've been accepting Bitcoin since before the block size wars, now using BTC Pay Server, and also accept Lightning payments. We also aim for radical transparency supported by open source software, regular audits, and a transparent team. And finally, there's absolutely no KYC with IVPN. We don't ask for an email or any other personal information when you sign up. If you would like to test our service, send an email to trial at ivpn.net to receive a 30-day IVPN Pro voucher. Hello, I'm Vlad and I have been a user of IVPN Pro for longer than one year. What I like the most about it is being able to use seven devices at the same time and using the multi-hop feature to connect to two different servers of my choosing at the same time. Also, your account consists of a randomly generated string of letters and numbers which are not linked to your email address, bank account or real life identity. You top it up with a lightning payment and you get instant confirmation at low fees. Definitely get your 30-day IVPN Pro trial by sending an email to trial at ivpn.net. Make sure you use a burner email address that you probably already have for trolling. Yeah, And I, I think it's coming back too. I think, honestly, I think this is the beginning of a new renaissance. Like I think it's already beginning. Like the Bitcoin culture is different. We have a lot more fun in Bitcoin than in, in a lot of other places. <laughs> I believe that. Yeah, I, I wanted to remark this because it's so easy to get stuck in this Bitcoin bubble 
which mm-hmm. feels like a cult sometimes and everyone agrees on some topics but then fights them on some other topics and it's like this it goes on and on it's never going to stop i kind of enjoy it sometimes just to poke holes in some narratives and then i get wrecked on twitter by people who, <laughs> who stay humble me. yeah yeah <laughs> but anyway what i was going to say is that the average bitcoiner is much more optimistic than yeah at, at least i, yeah. I and things my... longer term also like even you know like you're thinking supra <laughs> whereas another person is like i'm just gonna go drinking with the mates tonight i remember during the pandemic that everyone was freaking out and bitcoin was like oh yeah we have a new all-time high this is so cool well it, it was tough in march or something when there was that flash crash but afterwards yeah. Yeah. It, it kept getting better but I also had my birthday party this year and I invited my friends from university and I expected them to be somewhat the same that I remembered them. But three of them are depressed and go to do psychological wow. therapy. And one of them takes Xanax and I was like, what the fuck? You're 29. What's wrong with you? Grandma was taking Xanax and she was 80 something. Yeah, no, absolutely. It's it's an epidemic. Like um people, I mean, I I I remember when I was little, we traveled me and my parents, we traveled to Russia and I remember the physically how people were like they looked down more, their their faces were more like poker face or um only when they were like drinking was there like, you know, was there more life? And, uh, and so I think it's like animals in captivity, you know, people feel more and more that they are becoming more poor and it's not getting better. And whatever the politicians are promising, it gets worse and worse. And every time you lose a bit more control and then there is more violence in society as well. And they don't understand it and they're scared. And I, I, I think it's affecting everything like just how in the cold war people thought the world was going to blow up because of you know russia was going to drop bombs uh i think it makes people it really affects like the music from the 80s as well you can hear it it's like very serious and and monotone and and like you know we're going down and it's happening and you know robotic voices and so yeah i mean i um I, uh, it, yeah, it's, it's, it's the reality. The world, the mental health is, yeah, I think you're seeing it very correctly, like in your friends and stuff that, uh, we need something to, that gives us hope. And I think Bitcoin is really one of those things. And also out of Bitcoin comes, is going to come more tools to help actually people get healthier because also i think that the fiat system is enmeshed with the government and then you get big pharma and and um you know so much of the medication of big pharma is just symptom treatment it doesn't really solve the issue right it doesn't go to the core of why you're depressed it just makes you a little bit less downy and a little less up and you're more like a zombie and um and so i think that with the bitcoin renaissance is also going to come different ways to approach health and mental health i think we already see that like most bitcoiners are not really into xanax you know (laughs) (laughs) i don't know you're gonna have to do a survey on what were the most acquired drugs on silk road but anyway well at least there's more choice there i mean i don't want to promote the silk road but at least you know there's a broader array of options then your local pharmacy is very much going to be uh um anti-psychotics antidepressant like all these uh, ssris that that are proven to not go to the root of the problem they they never do no i do agree that we need a new philosophy and we need something that's more mm-hmm. in line with the progress of our times But you mentioned something interesting with Russia, and we can get a bit into geopolitics. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to ask you, what's your take on what's happening in two places, which one of them is becoming more, at least for myself, is becoming more disillusioned, and the other one is becoming super hopeful. And they're both in Latin America. The first one... Which one one is the disillusioned one? Yeah, which is that one? El Salvador. Ah, interesting. 
I think that the way in which they handled Bitcoin adoption was terrible from the beginning with the custodial government endorsed wallet and the fact that they don't have any privacy in their transactions. So they can use Bitcoin, they can accept it for, from strangers who come to pay, but they don't benefit from the point of Bitcoin, which is to have some sort of leverage against your own government to not be able to get censored, to not have your money confiscated, to have a degree of privacy. And they launched that program with $1 million for visa or something, citizenship. And also yeah. they turned ordinal inscriptions into a crime or something. So if you're selling essentially a Bitcoin unit that's marked within their territory, you go to jail. I thought that was strange. And that was promoted by Max Kaiser, who for years tried to ridicule mm. authoritarians around the world. And it seems like he's trying to play the role of one, at least the advisor in this whole scheme. And the, the positive one is Argentina, where you had, we have right now the first non-socialist president, to put it lightly. <laughs> in a few decades, they have had this socialist rule and... I was there for La Bitconf, and that was one week before the elections. And the whole, I mean, it's not the whole country. It was just a part of Buenos Aires that I saw. But everyone was in this state of purgatory, as in they were waiting to see if it gets worse because of the continuation of the existing regime, or if there's going to be some sort of change. And nobody was sure if that was the right kind of change, but it was still something that was moving them in some direction. And Millet seems to be very much into free markets and is open to the idea of Bitcoin, even though I don't think he's going to do anything legal tenderish. He just wants stuff to exist on an open market. And yeah, to me, that's hopeful, even though people are now pointing fingers that he speaks with other world leaders and is not that anarchist that they expected. I mean, he's the president now. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so El Salvador and Argentina. Well, the way I think about El Salvador in general, it's, it, it just reminds me of the early Bitcoin companies that were founded, um, you know, like blockchain.info and um, BitPay, and there were a few others that were very, very early. And I think it's, it's very valuable because it gives us just kind of information on what is possible and... and, um, and uh, to me, it just shows a direction where we're heading. Like they're the, the first ones, they're going to make mistakes. They're pioneering, but it doesn't mean that they are establishing the model for everybody else to follow um, with the specifics like that, the Chivo wallet and things like that. Um, and they may find that as the competition grows, that they're going to have to adapt to survive. You know, other there's going to be other offerings that are maybe more attractive to people uh, in other countries. Um, so yeah, to me, it's just mostly encouraging that it, it's happening and, you know, I don't think I'm going to move to El Salvador. Like I'm, I'm going to like wait it out and I might vacation there. But to me, the, the main concern would probably be like long-term, like, you know, how do you, how do you establish rule of law in a country that, that, maybe doesn't have as long as a history with that you know that that seems like a real challenge uh how do the how does the court system work and things like that i'm just not not familiar and it seems like yeah maybe bukele can make a lot of changes because that's how these countries work like they the the president gets a lot of power but then yeah what about the next guy you know that that could just maybe change everything uh, backwards again but so yeah, I'm, I'm not that I'm pessimistic on El Salvador in particular. I just think it's it's an early adopter, and there's what 230 countries in the world or something. So we're gonna have a lot more examples. Um, and so to me, Millet is incredibly interesting in Argentina because he he does have that like philosophical backbone. Like he really he articulates very well these core ideas of classical liberalism. And of course, anarcho-capitalism that, you know, property rights are so important and that the government needs to get out of the way. Um, 
And so actually, I'm, I'm more optimistic for like a long term future for Bitcoin in Argentina based on that kind of a basis, because that's ultimately what you need is a culture of supporting property rights and things like that. And actually, he's not been. Uh, um, Jameson Lobb dug a, an old tweet of his from 2019 where somebody asked him, like, hey, what do you think of Bitcoin? And he was very mm -hmm. humble. I haven't studied it, so I don't I don't want to speak about it. I don't know about it yet. Um, that, to me, is very encouraging. And, of course, we know Peter McCormack has been in touch with people around him and other Bitcoiners. Like, there are Bitcoiners in his entourage. Like, you know, he's not... He's, he's going to get orange-pilled. Um, it's just going to maybe take some time. And I think it's also very wise of him to not jump. That's also... It might be a bad sign if he had been talking about Bitcoin because it might signal that he's actually more opportunistic, right? And the fact that he's just focused on like, let's get our shit together, um, you know, fire all these ministries and, and shrink the government, um, stabilize the inflation somewhat, and then see what's next. That's I think that's the most responsible thing to do. But yeah, incredible to see his speech, his acceptance speech. It's just like, holy shit. I've never, ever, ever heard a speech like that by uh, a newly sitting president. Or a politician in general. I mean, a politician yeah. who got elected into office because you can get candidates who can say any stuff. But maybe, maybe like a Vaclav Havel or some like, you know, you know, like just when, when the Soviet Union crumbled and there was some like there was some radical stuff in Eastern Europe. Maybe, but I, I haven't studied it close enough to know like how well versed were these people in in really the philosophy of classical liberal ideas. Like Millet is up there. Like I would read I would want to read his book even if he wasn't president. Like, you know, he's he's incredibly well spoken, not just like, oh, silver tongue devil, but like there's a real foundation to his um, his ideas. Sadochip provides open source solutions based on smart card to assist you in your crypto journey. The hardware wallet lets you safely store your private keys within the tamper proof chip memory while Sato Dime allows you to create a barrier cold storage in two clicks, thanks to its mobile app. And SeedKeeper is the ultimate hardware device to store and manage your seed phrases. Become self-custody with Sato Chip. Your keys, your coins. I think he also has a very nice way of engaging audiences. When he starts yeah. his... Beach is saying that he doesn't try to speak to sheep, but to wake up lions. And the way that he uses carajo, which means it's a bad word in Spanish, but he says, Viva la libertad carajo. It's like long live freedom, damn it. It's almost like a, a scream of frustration that he utters at the end. And she's like, yeah, let's, let's do this because it's, this is the way it's supposed to be. And it, found its way it it resonated among the average person in argentina and i found it very fascinating i i took taxi rides in buenos aires and every time i was asking the driver so what do you think about the presidential elections it was interesting to me because those people were outside of the usual libertarian bitcoin circles yeah and out of six or seven only two of them said that they were going to vote for the other guy whose name is Millet. But the argument against wait, wait uh, you mean the other guy who is Massa, right? Massa, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I messed up. But their only mm. argument again against Millet was that he's crazy. But that's their perception, you know. Yeah, no, I think Millet really gave people a voice. It's like they felt like that's always how I, when I have a tweet that goes viral, like the way I think about it is usually that. I managed to put something into words that people already felt, but now they're like, yes, that's what I meant. That's what I'm... And I feel like that's how people think about Millet is like, oh, like he's saying, he's giving me a voice, right? Because people have been so indoctrinated by the school system, et cetera, that they feel like something's wrong, but they don't know what it is. And like to have someone that actually puts it into words is so powerful. Like the chanting and the... 
you know, it, it, it really very, very moving to see, to see what's going on. Yeah, I was thinking right now that there is no way for me to end this interview with you without mm -hmm. asking you about music. And oh, you're yeah. very much into rock and roll, but not just that. <laughs> also, music from the 60s, 70s, 80s. You described some of the feelings of pessimism from the 80s. But what do you mm -hmm. think are some quintessential, maybe not albums, maybe you're not going to recommend albums, but songs or elements to have in your playlist for a Bitcoiner to get into that Bitcoin Whoa. spirit? I mean, Oliver Anthony, you can't do without him. Like, like it's just this, the, 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 the Richmond, North of Richmond, I think is, you know, it's, it's going to be an anthem. It's going to stay, stick around the, this idea of like, so that's, sorry, Oliver Anthony is a new, a new artist uh, who went from zero to number one and all the charts without even having an album, like just with some songs that he put online. Um, Huh, some songs for Bitcoiners. That's a fun one. I mean, I, I like... Uh, <laughs> um, what is it again? This Train? Um, I forget what it's called. Uh, Johnny Cash and the, the Millionaire Quartet. Um, wait, I'm not logged into Spotify, am I? Let's see if I... No, but that's very eclectic when you think about it. You recommend a singer songwriter of our times and johnny cash uh yeah well let's see if i can find it the this this train is bound for glory yeah and the version that i like is um it was a tribute i think it was a uh a tribute song all right let's see if it goes on. Uh, oh, yeah, it was a tribute to Woody Guthrie. So I, I wonder if it's actually a song that he wrote. But This Train is Bound for Glory is basically this, like, um, a song that says, like, look, we are this this merry band of ours. We're on the train. And, of course, it's it's religious, right? It's like we're, we're going to heaven. Uh, but then they're saying the way that they're describing who's on the train is by talking about everybody who's not on the train. So there's no liars, there's no cheaters. Uh, and it just, I find that like, I don't know. I just love the song. Um, and so I, that's kind of how I feel about Bitcoin is like, we're just, we're going not just to the moon in terms of price, but like, we're going to a better future and, uh, and we're having a lot of fun and we're not really into all this all these shenanigans of fraud and cheating and so those people are not going to be on our train they're going to fool themselves anyway they're going to jump off uh, they're going to rage quit um so yeah that that's one of my the songs that i i feel like and then uh, the other one is uh five foot high and rising which is also johnny cash which he sung about his youth like he literally their farm flooded and um uh, the father stayed behind to try and save what he could. Um, but so every, every part of the song, the, the refrain is like this many feet and rising. So it's like three feet and rising, four feet and rising. And so I think that's, to me, that's how I think a lot of people feel with the inflation. It's just gradually things are just getting worse and worse. And, um, and they don't know what to do. It's a, you see it in all these little TikTok videos of moms that are desperate. And even though they have a full-time job, they can't pay the bills. Um, so, yeah, I mean, these are just, just a few ideas. I feel like everybody has to make their own uh, Bitcoin playlist. Mm. Are you into Bob Dylan? Um, not really into, into. Like, I enjoy him occasionally. Um, I, I His voice is a little nasal um i i don't i don't mind him I, I would say i'm more into uh i actually saw him live once uh, yeah, in too. brussels yeah it, it was a huge disappointment i i wish i didn't go with <laughs> any expectations yeah if he had a bad night you know he's just kind of mumbling oh what was it i remember he was doing like how does it feel oh you're wrong. it's like that was what i remember like he was just mumbling um but I, I like them a lot. I, I'm definitely a fan of the Traveling Wilburys. Do you know them? Mm -hmm. Yeah. It yeah, was so a super the, the all-star band. Yeah, the super band. With Roy so, Orbison, Tom Petty, yeah. and Jeff Lynne of the Electric exactly. Light Orchestra. 
yeah. and Bob Dylan and George Harrison. Exactly, yeah. I have their two records on vinyl. Oh, neato. Wow. Yeah, it's great. Just really amazing. That's amazing what I did color. 10 years ago. Instead of buying Bitcoin, I bought vinyls. <laughs> oh, wow. Yeah, I used to... I used to go to the library a lot. I had like two library cards and I would get like t uh, 10 CDs and then I would listen and, and pick what I like and, and make tapes. So I had like 200 or 300 tapes and I would buy, it would be cheaper than buying CDs, uh, buying buying CDs as well. And then I, I lost most of them because I moved so many times. I, I lost my music collection. So sometimes still I remember like, oh, I was like, oh yeah, I was into that. And then I looked them up online. Um but yeah, I, 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 what kind of um, what kind of rock are you into? Mm, I like classic rock. I think that's the one that got me into the genre. Is also, that like seventies, or what do you consider classic rock? Sixties and seventies, but I also yeah. like the rock and roll of the fifties, like Chuck Berry. He was very yep. much ahead of his time. If you listen to the lyrics, he basically invented the vocabulary of rock and roll. Everyone else used the same words, the same rhymes. It's kind of insane. Also, mm. Little Richard mm. is incredible. There's a documentary on him now. It's on, I think, Amazon Video or something recently. I don't watch movies too much, but I listen to a lot of music. And I also want to say that I like mm. the grunge generation. The 1990s, mm. very... I, I think it was the symbolism from poetry transposed into music. You know, yeah, because like they, they, they were into Buk and Buk Bukowski and, and uh, some of the, yeah, some of the like, uh, I don't mean, well, you said Arthur, Arthur Rimbaud, is, is that who you mentioned? Yeah, Rimbaud and Berlin and who's the other one, the big one? From that, uh, Verlaine? You mean who, that? Who wrote period? Le Fleur du Mal? Yeah, I think that's Paul Verlaine. Okay. Paul Verlaine, Le Fleur du Mal. We actually read that in high school. Uh, wait. Baudelaire. Uh, oh. Baudelaire, that's the one. Le Fleur du Mal. Oh, you're right. Is that when he was in prison? I think yeah, he wrote it when he was point... in prison and he's talking about anyway. So, but yeah, it's like the, you mean like it's like romanticism in a way? No, no, no. It's very real, very authentic and dark mm. and soulful. And it, it contrasts what came before. And it was that plastic 1980s yep. speedo, speed rock or whatever. Everyone was well, on I've, cocaine. and Exactly. Very dissociated and leotards. And no, yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm also like I was, I was 10 years old when I first heard nirvana like and i i really was blown away and and then weird i thought i was like i want to find more music like this and then i got like a cd that said like heavy metal and i had like different songs and it, i was like what is this like that's not what i thought like nirvana is a lot heavier like because you know they were like heavy metal but like to me it, there was just more real emotion and and so i i've always stuck with the i, I guess yeah I, I listen to a lot of grunge, definitely, like um, like Soundgarden. And, oh, yeah. Uh, I think that's my favorite. But if you ask me tomorrow, I think I'm going to say Alice in Chains. <laughs> well, yeah. And have you ever uh, discovered Temple of the Dog? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Like, there's, there's a lot of good stuff. Uh, from, And it's interesting how, like, geographically concentrated they were, like, in the, in the Northwest there. Um, but, yeah, so it's um, – that was that – was, Cool. I, I'm really happy. I I was a child in the '90s rather than the '80s, um, or like at least that you know that I started to get into my teenage years in the in the '90s. <clears throat> yeah, I Good think stuff. coming back to the question that I asked, I, w I was expecting you to say something along the lines of "Rage Against the Machine" because that's the easiest one to point out to, <laughs> even though it's kind of hypocritical from their point of view as they stand for big government and they seem to be very compliant nowadays. They Yeah, exactly. Is that they're both they're both like uh, kind of communists. Like I think that when they think the machine, it's like 
business world as well. And so, uh, yeah, it's a little, I, I, I like that album, you know, that, that is a crazy good album. Uh, the 1992 one or 93. Yeah. Um, yeah. The one with people on fire. On yeah. The with cover. the monk. Yeah. Really powerful. But, but so yeah, ideologically they're much more like extreme left. Um, so I don't feel that much like kinship to, to that. Yeah, but that's a very easy example to pick when you think about. Yeah, the oh. banking system, like, oh, screw the bankers, like maybe that, yeah. Yeah, yeah, I think much of the Bitcoin ethos comes from the Occupy Wall Street movement and mm. the Ron Paul campaign from 2008. Yep. Much of that shaped what the Bitcoin culture is. And many of these narratives were taken by young people who discovered this new form of money and they figured out what it can be. But yeah. Exciting times. Yeah, we live in exciting we're, times. We're creating our own philosophy. And I think that's what keeps me excited about this because otherwise I can get into fights about technical stuff like liquid versus something else on Twitter, like rootstock mm. or whatever. And I, I get, I don't know, I, I get stuck for hours trying to reply to people reasonably. And then I think I had a fight with Giacomo Zucco last night. I got blocked by Max Kaiser. And this is how it happens. You know, you, you get blocked by people and then you meet them at some conference in a few months and you're in some dark bar at, at an after party and you ask the other guy, so why did you block me? And they're like, oh, I blocked you. And that's when you <laughs> make up and it, you reset the cycle. I think yeah, that's how it really goes. sweet. Yeah, I think, I think in, in many ways, in many ways, we're, um, we're working on similar things, even if we come at it from different angles. Um, that that's part of what's yeah what's what's beautiful about this is like you 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 it's like with family too you have fights sometimes and then you make it up and you just you're connected anyway like you can't help but be connected yeah i mean i also feel sympathetic maybe you disagree with me with the big blockers and i feel like they're misguided because they were right about a momentary problem but they were wrong about the solution and they were very impatient mm. about that one solution and yeah there there have been some people that have come around right that have been like oh you know i was in favor of big blocks but i've come around and so you know it's like the same with no coiners like you know a big blocker can also come around to bitcoin just like a no coiner can eventually come around yeah mm. i'm not sure if i have any more questions which is blasphemous tour because we could talk probably for days about stuff, mm. but how can people follow you and what is the project that makes you proudest these days? Uh-huh. Well, I have some things in the work that I cannot talk about yet, but um, I, uh, I'm i definitely proud of being involved in the Texas Bitcoin Foundation. We do great stuff. Um, and uh, the companies that I advise for are also just great companies, and I, I really enjoy working with them. And yeah, you can just Google my name, uh, Dude Meister, or adamantresearch.com has a, an archive of my my reports. You can just download the PDFs there uh, without a paywall or anything. Um, so yeah, I would say that. I'm mostly on Twitter. Yeah, like most of us. So thank you very much, Tour. This was really great. And mm. maybe we'll talk again at the end of the bull cycle and try to backtrack and figure out where we were wrong. <laughs> you got to take me in a ride in your Supra. Yeah, let's, yeah, yeah. let's do that sometimes. I will. I promise. If I take that to conferences, which I'm yeah. seriously considering. I mean, seriously, I, I will take a ride in it. If, if you bring it along, I would love that. That would be so I'm, much I'm a, fun. I'm a fan of Toyota. Toyota is good stuff.